In an earlier video, I had said that PCA can be sometimes used to speed up the running time of a learning algorithm. In this video, I'd like to explain how to actually do that, and also say some, uh, so just try to give some advice about how to apply PCA. Here's how you can use PCA to speed up a learning algorithm, and this uh, supervised learning algorithm speed up is actually the most common use of that that you know I personally make of PCA. Let's say you have a supervised learning problem. Notice a supervised learning problem with inputs x and labels y. And um, let's say that your examples xi are very high dimensional. So let's say xi are you know, uh, 10,000 dimensional feature vectors. One example of that would be if you were doing some computer vision problem where you have 100 by 100 images. And so if you have 100 by 100, that's 10,000 pixels. And so if xi are you know, uh, feature vectors that contain your 10,000 pixel intensity values, then you have 10,000 dimensional feature vectors. So with very high dimensional feature vectors like this, a running learning, a learning algorithm can be slow, right? Just if you feed, you know, 10,000 dimensional feature vectors into logistic regression or a neural network or support vector machine or what have you, just because that's a lot of data, that's 10,000 numbers, um, it can make your learning algorithm run more slowly. Fortunately, with PCA, we'll be able to reduce the dimension of this data and so make our algorithms run more efficiently. Here's how you do that. We're going to first take our label training set and extract just the inputs. So I'm just going to extract the x's and you know temporarily put aside the y's. So this will now give us an unlabeled training set, so this x1 through xm, which are maybe there's a 10,000 dimensional data, 10,000 dimensional examples we have. So just extract the input vectors x1 through xm. Then we're going to apply PCA, and this will give me a reduced dimension representation of data. So instead of 10,000 dimensional feature vectors, I now have maybe 1,000 dimensional feature vectors. So that's like a 10x savings. So this gives me, if you will, a new training set. So whereas previously I might have had an example x1, y1, my first training input is now represented by z1, and so I'm going to have a new sort of training example, which is z1 paired with y1, and similarly z2, y2, and so on, up to zm, ym, because my training examples are now represented with this much lower dimensional representation, z1, z2, up to zm. Finally, I can take this um, reduced dimension training set and feed it to a learning algorithm, maybe a neural network, maybe logistic regression, and I can learn a hypothesis h that takes as input these uh, lower dimensional representations z and tries to make predictions. Uh, and so if I were using logistic regression, for example, I would train a hypothesis that outputs, you know, 1 over 1 plus e to the negative theta transpose z, or theta transpose z, uh, that takes as input to one of these z vectors and tries to make a prediction. And finally, if you have a new example, maybe a new test example x, what you do is you would take your new test example x, map it through the same mapping that was found by PCA to get you your corresponding z, and that z then gets fed to this hypothesis, and this hypothesis then makes a prediction on your input x. One final note, what PCA does is it defines a mapping from x to z. And um, this mapping from x to z should be defined by running PCA only on the training set. And in particular, this mapping that PCA is learning, right, this mapping, what that does is it computes a set of parameters, right? There's the uh, feature scaling and mean normalization, and there's also computing this matrix U reduce. But all of these things that like U reduce, that's like a parameter that is learned by PCA, and we should be fitting our parameters only to our training sets and not to our cross validation or test sets. And so these things, the U reduce and so on, that should be obtained by running PCA only on your training set. And then having found U reduce or having found you know the parameters for feature scaling, right? The mean normalization and the scaling, the, the, the scale that you divide the features by to get them onto comparable scales. But having found all those parameters on the training set, you can then apply the same mapping to other examples that may be uh, in your cross-validation sets or in your or in your test sets.
in the episode, just to summarize, when you're running PCA, run your PCA only on the training set portion of your data, not the cross-validation set or the tested portion of your data. And that defines the mapping from X to Z, and you can then apply that mapping to your cross-validation set and your test set. And by the way, in this example, I talked about uh, reducing the data from 10,000 dimensional to 1,000 dimensional. This is actually not that unrealistic. For many problems, we can actually reduce the dimension of data, you know, by 5x, maybe by 10x, and still retain most of the variance. And we can do this with uh, barely affecting the performance in terms of classification accuracy, let's say, barely affecting the uh, classification accuracy of the learning algorithm. And by working with low dimensional data, our learning algorithm can often run much, much faster. To summarize, we've so far talked about um, the following applications of PCA. First is the compression application, where we might do so to reduce the memory or the disk space needed to store data. And we just talked about how to use this to speed up a learning algorithm. In these applications, in order to choose K, often we'll do so according to to figuring out what is the percentage of variance retained. And so is for this a uh, learning algorithm speed up application, you know, often will retain 99% of the variance. That would be a very typical choice for how to choose K. So that's how you choose K for these compression applications. Whereas uh, for visualization applications, well, usually we know how to plot only two-dimensional data or three-dimensional data. And so for visualization applications, we would usually choose k equals 2 or k equals 3 because you know, we can plot only 2D and 3D data sets. So that summarizes the main applications of PCA as well as how to choose the value of k for these different applications. I should mention that there's often that there's one frequent misuse of PCA. And you sometimes hear about others doing this, hopefully not too often, but just want to mention this uh, so that you know not to do it. And there's one bad use of PCA, which is to try to use it to prevent overfitting. Here's the reasoning. This is not, this, and really this is not a great way to use PCA, but here's, here's the reasoning behind this method, which is, you know, if we have XI, then maybe we'll have N features, but if we compress the data and use ZI instead, then that reduces the number of features to K, which could be much lower dimensional. And so if we have a much smaller number of features, so if K is, you know, 1,000 and N is 10,000, then, well, if we have only a thousand dimensional data, maybe we're less likely to overfit than if we were using 10,000 dimensional data with like a thousand features. You know? And so some people think of PCA as a way to prevent overfitting. But um, just to emphasize, this is a bad application of PCA, and I do not recommend doing this. And it's not that this method works badly. You know, if, if you were to use this method to reduce the dimensional data to try to prevent overfitting, it, it might actually work okay. But um, this just is not the a good way to address overfitting. And instead, if you're worried about overfitting, there's a much better way to address it, to use regularization instead of using PCA to reduce the dimension of your data. And the reason is, if you think about how PCA works, it does not use the labels Y, right? You're just looking at your inputs XI, and you're using that to find a lower dimensional approximation to your data. So what PCA does is it throws away some of some information. It throws away or reduces the dimension of your data without knowing what the values of Y is. So this is probably okay. Using PCA this way is probably okay if, say, 99% of the variance are retained, if you're keeping most of the variance. But uh, it might also throw away some valuable information. And it turns out that you know, if you're retaining 99% of the variance or 95% of the variance or whatever, it turns out that uh, just using regularization will often give you at least as good a method for preventing overfitting. And regularization will often work just work better because when you're applying linear regression or logistic regression or some other method with regularization, well, this minimization problem actually knows what the values of y are, and so it's less likely to throw away some valuable information, whereas PCA doesn't make use of the labels and is more likely to throw away valuable information. So just summarize, it is a good use of PCA if your main motivation is to speed up your learning algorithm, but uh, using PCA to prevent overfitting, that's, that's not a good use of PCA, and using um, regularization instead is, is, is really what, uh, what, most peop what many people will recommend doing instead.
finally, one last uh, misuse of PCA. So I should say PCA is a very useful algorithm. I often use it, you know, for the compression or the visualization purposes. But what I sometimes see is also people sometimes use PCA where it shouldn't be. So here's a pretty common thing that I see, right? Which is if someone's designing a machine learning system, you know, they may write down a plan like this. You know, let's design a learning system. Go to the training set, and then you know what I'm going to do is run PCA, then train the just regression, and then test on my test data. So often at the very start of a project, someone would just write out a project plan that says let's do these four steps with PCA inside. Before writing out a project plan that incorporates PCA like this. One very good question to ask is, well, what if we were to just do the whole thing without using PCA? And um, often people do not consider this step before like coming up with a complicated project plan and, and implementing PCA and so on. And, uh, sometime, and, and so specifically, what I often, often advise people is, before you implement PCA, I would first suggest that you know do whatever it is, take whatever it is you want to do, and first consider doing it with your original raw data XI. And only if that doesn't do what you want, then implement PCA and consider using CI. So before using PCA, you know, instead of reducing the dimension of the data, I would consider, well, let's ditch this PCA step. And I would consider, let's just train my learning algorithm on my original data. Let's just use my original raw inputs XI. And I would recommend, instead of putting PCA into the algorithm, just try doing whatever it is you're doing with the XI first. And only if you have a reason to believe that doesn't work. So if only if your learning algorithm ends up running too slowly, or only if the memory requirement or the disk space requirement is too large, so you want to compress your representation. But only if using the XI doesn't work, only if you have evidence or a strong reason to believe that using the XI won't work, then implement PCA and consider using the compressed representation. Because what I do see is sometimes people start off with a project plan that incorporates PCA inside, and you know sometimes um, they, they whatever they're doing would have worked just fine even without using PCA instead. So just consider that as an alternative as well before you go and spend a lot of time to implement PCA and figure out what K is and so on. So that's it for PCA. Um, despite these last sets of comments, PCA is an incredibly useful algorithm when you use it for the appropriate applications, and I actually use PCA pretty often. And uh, for me, I use it mostly to speed up the running time of my learning algorithms, but I think almost just as common an application of PCA is to use it to compress data, to you know, reduce the uh, memory or disk space requirements, or to use it to visualize data. And um, PCA is one of the most commonly used and one of the most powerful unsupervised learning algorithms. And with uh, what you've learned in these videos, I think hopefully you'll be able to implement PCA and use them to all of these purposes as well.